So nature is showing us that immaterial stuff has somehow, through the process of history, generated immaterial mind. Now, that is the trajectory of nature. What if we, who are part of nature, might be on the same trajectory? Here we are, physical beings in the world, composites of mind and matter, and what if, what if we, following the path of nature, ultimately live on as mind, even if our physical frame stops? That is a possibility that is inscripted in nature itself. It's not out of the realm of possibility. I'm looking at nature itself to find clues about it. I might be wrong, but what's the better theory? Is there a rival theory? Just to simply declare that I've never seen anyone come back from the dead, therefore there is no life after death? Is that an argument? Would that be like saying, I've never been to India, therefore there's no one over there? <laughs> That's not an argument. You've never been there. So you don't know. If you were an open-minded person, you'd be looking for all kinds of possibilities to find out. Is there an India? What's it like over there? You wouldn't be trying to refute every possible report every time an Indian guy goes, I was really over there. You're lying. You're hallucinating. <laughs> That's, there needs to be an open-mindedness in engaging the issue. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's all the time we have right now for questions. give brief closing remarks. Mr. D'Souza, you're first. This is a debate on a topic that, in which certainty, <coughs> knowledge, full ability to make a decision seems impossible. And to some degree, some of the back and forth reflects that. I think there are two things we should think about. Number one, very often, religious believers are accused of holding things on blind faith. Atheists claim to be in possession of the evidence. Their position is reason-based. Our position is faith-based. I think it's become very clear tonight that whoever's right, we can have an argument on the basis of reason alone. And moreover, it seems that there's a certain dogmatism built into both sides. In some sense, as a believer, I'm committed to life after death. I believe it. I'm going to marshal evidence to try to show it exists. Dan doesn't want there to be life after death. He thinks it's terrible if they were. He's going to marshal evidence on the other side, but he's, in a way, just as faith-based in his denial as I would be in my affirmation. Now, when something like this is unknown, can't be known, we'll never know, how do we live? What do we do? It seems on the first glance that agnosticism is the correct answer. Let's wait. Let's don't take a position. Maybe the data will come in. I want to argue in my closing statement that this agnosticism is actually the most foolish position of all. Here's why. Because it is reasonable to wait for data on a subject in which data is going to become available. Imagine if I was dating a woman and trying to decide if I should propose marriage to her. And I date her for five years, and after that I say, well, you know what? I put in reason, say, she sounds perfect, but if I really ask what is life with this woman going to be like for the next 50 years, I really don't know. So what should I do? Well, maybe date her for another five years. <laughs> and at the end of that, I say, well, I still don't know the answer to that question. So I should be an agnostic. I should not make up my mind. I should wait for the data to come in. But the truth of it is, if I do that, she's going to marry someone else, or we'll both be dead. <laughs> in other words, the data will never be in. And the agnostic position, far from being an intelligent one, refuses to realize that in life, there are some issues on which we have to commit ourselves one way or the other. You'll do it when you graduate. Am I going to go to business school or law school or become a poet? you got to decide. Will you have full knowledge of what each outcome will produce? No. Even though you put in reason, that reason is very limited. Your life may go in a completely different direction, but you've got to go for it. Now, at some level I would submit that's true of this topic also. You have to ultimately weigh the evidence, but then you've got to decide 
Is it better for me to believe or not to believe? Ultimately, if you don't believe, you go with Dan, I would submit you're going for despair. Nihilism. Dan will deny this. Life is full of meaning, blah, blah, blah. But the truth of it is, that is the big wrecking ball that's waiting to smash our every plan. All your current projects, all your past experiences, every future blueprint is going to be for naught. So if it is true that there is no life after death, we are faced with, and Bertrand Russell, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, many realistic, thoughtful people have faced this despair and said that that's really modern man's only option in the face of atheism, and maybe it is. So if you want a life of despair, this is a very viable option for you. <laughs> On the other hand, if you believe in life after death, let me suggest a couple of practical benefits. First of all, it's going to make you face death much better. It's a fact that we're going to have to face death, Dan and I, in any case. <clears throat> Belief in life after death will make that experience much better for you. It will give you a sense of hope, of consolation, in the face of death. Second, if there is an afterlife, you have a reason to believe in cosmic justice. We say in America, what goes around comes around, but it's kind of a lie. Many times the bad guy ends up on top. Many times the good guy comes to grief. However, if there's life after death, morality has a certain kind of a cosmic foundation because there is a sense in which, in the afterlife, terrestrial accounts are settled. There will be eternal justice. It also gives us a basis for teaching morality to our children. But belief in life after death creates a life in which we are part of a cosmic drama. Our life is not generated by accident and chance. It's not meaningless in the cosmic sense. It is part, if you will, of a deep and profound mystery. So the experience of the sublime, which we normally have very rarely in life, only occasionally, at the top of a mountain, in sexual experience, that fragmentary experience of eternity, life after that gives us that experience of the sublime on a regular basis. So when you weigh the evidence, and you weigh the benefits, you find that it makes more reason, more sense, and ultimately will give you a more fulfilled life to believe in life after death, and to believe in eternity. Thank you very much. My mother died in 2004 as an atheist, after years of being a Sunday school teacher. She did not die a death of despair. Darrell, were you in the room when that happened? You were there, weren't you? I didn't make it at that moment. She died looking into my dad's eyes. She couldn't talk because of the tube that was in her throat. Looking at him with gratitude, as if to say thank you for a wonderful life. She died not believing in life after death, but she died having lived a life of dignity and morality and goodness. No one was a better woman than that woman. No one. There's no one like her. She's dead now. She's gone. When Carl Sagan died, his widow, Andrianne, knew he was, they were saying goodbye forever. You can read in the book that she wrote about the death. They held hands, and she was looking at him for the last time, and they said, we had a wonderful 20 years together, and that's it. It's over. Goodbye. Thank you for the wonderful ride. The picture that Dinesh tries to paint, this evangelistic picture that atheists live these lives of despair is completely false. It's a lie from the pulpit. Millions of good people in this country, tens of millions of good people in this country live lives of meaning and hope. And how dare someone like Dinesh stand up here like a proud peacock and, and tell me that my life lacks meaning. Tell me that I don't know how to be moral. Tell me that I don't have hope. To, make, to solve problems and make this world a better place. How dare you insult our species with such denigrating words. You sound like a preacher in a pulpit. I did not say that I don't want there to be life after death. You misunderstood me. What I said was that if life after death is this disembodied soul that goes up like anybody else, well then thanks but no thanks. I think it would be great to have life after death with this body. I think it would, that joke that I told I think it would be wonderful to extend our lives. I'm not opposed to that fact. But what I am kind of, what I do have trouble with is admiring 
the kind of a deity who would run put us through our paces on this planet to test our morality or our goodness and then build a place called hell we haven't talked much about hell build a place like hell where someone like my mom who is a non-believer who rejected Jesus my mom is supposedly according to Dinesh's Bible suffering eternal torture any system of thought that has to use a threat of violence to make its point, which is what the Bible does, and which Dinesh's God does. He uses a threat of eternal violence. Jesus called it a lake of fire. Any system of thought that has to scare a child who goes to bed at night thinking I might, I, there might be demons and I might have to go to hell. Any system of thought like that is morally bankrupt and should be banned from all civil society. Maybe it is true that believing in a fairy tale makes you a better person. I doubt it. The studies show that Christians, born again Christians especially, are not any better off. Born again Christians have a higher divorce rate, by the way, than atheists. Did you know that? Southern Baptists are at the highest end of it. At the low end are Roman Catholics and atheists, have the lowest divorce rate. Uh, there are studies that show that Mormons are healthier. So should we all become Mormons because they are healthier than others? Uh, I, think, I think there's no doubt that during a couple of weeks in the middle of December, the behavior of children across this country is immensely improved <laughs> with the expectation of a visit from Santa Claus. Should we then get up in the pulpit and preach Santa Claus because we want people to have this false belief so that their behavior will be improved? Bertrand Russell did grapple with these issues. Uh, Bertrand Russell admitted finally that, you know what? Our happiness is transitory and it is brief, but the fact that it comes to an end doesn't mean it's any less happy. We live now. Dinesh admits, I think the greatest admission from this debate, that Dinesh admits that he does not know. He's choosing to believe. And we all know that the source of his belief comes from a revealed book, a flawed, contradictory, unhistorical, immoral, <coughs> non-scientific book that he can't even defend. Uh, and, it, and that belief in heaven and hell and God comes from this revelation from a culture that was invaded into, into the continent we live by these Portuguese believers who had a sword in one hand and a Bible in the other. He admits that it comes through that book, but that book is flawed. Your inf information about this deity is a flawed source of information. Bertrand Russell said the fact that it comes to an end doesn't mean that, our, that happiness is any less. I submit the fact that it comes to an end makes the happiness greater. The fact that it is brief makes our enjoyment of life even more special. If you knew you were gonna die next month, then you'd be looking at life completely differently. You'd be appreciating, this is the last time I'm gonna see my nephew or see the trees changing color. You'd be looking around. That's how atheists view the world. We know we're gonna die. We accept the stark reality of our deaths. We face it with dignity. And that enhances our life now. Because the beauty of it, we don't sacrifice any current enjoyment on the altar of some promise of a supernatural transcendent existence. I think this whole idea of heaven and hell is just a whip. I think that if you are motivated to be a good person because of the promise of heaven, that shows how little you think of other people. Or if you are motivated to be a good person because of avoiding the threat of hell, that shows how little you think of yourself. We atheists and agnostics and secular humans say, let's just be good. There's no big mystery. Let's just be kind and good people and use reason and get through our lives uh, with a minimal amount of violence and more understanding. Thank you. This was a wonderful...